seated. We'll switch gears to the front of the eye. It's a completely different topic. It's far away from retina and research and looking back. Um, indeed. Um, so I'm going to share a few different cases that I think uh, will be of interest to anyone doing cataract surgery. Um, patient one, and I'll try to keep this uh, interactive, so I'm going to pick on certain residents, so no, uh, no offense to anyone. Um, patient number one, um, 64-year-old, uh, three plus NS in the right eye, unaffected vision, 2100, refraction is given. So we do the topography, let's see. Um, Russell, how would you interpret this topography? No, that's a that's a cloud claw too. What is that? What is that signifying? Excellent. So um, this indeed patient did indeed have pellucid marginal degeneration, uh, and Russell's referring to this cl crab claw appearance of skew deviation of the uh, of the um, zones of astigmatism. So you have patient with PMD and cataract. Now Russell noted, it picked out the astigmatism of 5.6 generated by the computer. But if you look closer at the central zone, actually there's about 7.3 diopters of astigmatism centrally. And the reason I point that out is in these um, complex eyes, the astigmatism given by the topographer is often not quite accurate. And so it's, it is valuable to take a step and look at the central zone. If you average these numbers out, you get about 7.3 diopters of cylinder. So um, what I planned to do uh, was insert a T9 lens, um, should correct about 4, 4.1 diopters of cylinder and do AK incisions, astigmatic keratotomy incisions, at a 380 micron depth of a seven millimeter optical zone. And by my nomogram, that should correct about 2.3 diopters. I did not want to be too aggressive on the AKs at a seven millimeter optical zone, because if you do too much, you can destabilize the cornea, especially in a patient with PMD. So conceptually, what we did was take this cornea, inserted the lens, along this axis, <coughs> did AK incisions at the maximal areas of astigmatism, and that resulted in an uncorrected visual acuity of 2040 with a best correction of 2025, very close to our target. So 7.3 diopters, take away 4.1 with the toric, take away another 2.3, he's left with about one and a half, as you'd expect. Now, could I have done more AK? Sure. But that would have, I thought, risked some uh, destabilization of the cornea, so I chose not to. Number two, patient with RK, about 20 years ago, eight cut RK, got a cataract in the right eye. Best correction with refraction was 2100. Let's see, Brian, how would you interpret this topography? Oh, sorry, Brian Zog. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, Brian, I did see you, but I was referring to Zog. I can't even say Brian Arx Foundation. You both have Arx. Yeah, that, that probably doesn't matter so much. So 
Again, the computer tricked you. So 0.6 <coughs> diopters of cylinder on this uh, computer reading, and everything just looks blue centrally from the RK flattening. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that everything looks blue, but the scale only starts at 38 and a half. So if you get this kind of picture, ask your tech to lower the scale. Okay. Um, because when you look centrally, you see there's actually, it's not just all flat. 32 diopters, 31 diopters vertically, 36 or 37 more obliquely. So there's actually a lot of stuff going on in the central cornea that's not visible by just looking at that central token. And so paying attention to the scale relative to what's going on is key. And you know, very often the computer just sees something, the tech prints it out, no one takes a moment to look at the scale. And you think there's only 0.6 diopters of cylinder when there's a lot more. The, com the computer would still say 0.6, but you would have a color cue that would say, hey, I need to take a look at this more. Yeah, the IOL master is measuring um, the central um, three, three and a half millimeters. Um, it's measuring at um, 12 points, the lens star measures at 21 points, um, the lens star measures out to 4.5 millimeters as well. In the post-refractive surgery cornea, um, the IOL master is essentially useless for keratometry readings. It's great for axial mark, but it's essentially us useless for keratometry readings. And <coughs> for that matter, the topography doesn't, you can't go off the topo numbers either by themselves. So we talked about the central cornea. Now, if you plug all this into the IOL Aspris calculator for post-RK patients, it recommends doing a IOL power of 23.5. Okay, now remember that number. 23.5 is what the Aspris calculator recommends. Now, Penicam, we have. Penicam measures the posterior cornea. It's very helpful in these post-refractive cornea. And this is a typical Pentacam printout. And for refractive surgery, for LASIK and PRK, you're going to pay attention to the front, you're going to pay attention to the thickness map and the posterior cornea. But that's not actually what we need here. We need what's called the EKR report. Again, you have to ask your tech to go print the EKR report. And here, what you find of use is the following. First, look at the central K given by the pentacam, and the K is given at the one and two millimeter zone. And if you average all of these numbers, that I find, the zero, one, and two millimeter zones in the pentacam, that I find gives a very nice estimate of keratometry in a post-RK or post-LASIK eye. And then the next thing you want to piece is the astigmatism, about six diopters at a two millimeter zone, about four and a half diopters at a three millimeter zone. And averaging the, the cylinder at two or three millimeters gives you a very good sense of what astigmatism you need to see, again, on these post-arcane, post-lasic eyes. And when you average the zero, one, and two zones and plug that into the IOL master, 31.61 millimeters, axial length of 26.92 given by the IOL master, we get a predicted, uh, using the SRKT formula, 24.5 millimeters, about 24.5 diopters. As opposed to if you had just used the IOL master numbers, okay? You see that? The IOL master gives a much higher reading than what we plugged in from the pentacam. Okay. So if we had gone with the IOL master readings, we would have inserted, you know, a 20 or a 20 and a half diopter lens. Let's see. First year resident. Maybe first year resident. Is Russell the only one? Ah, right, sorry. 
I keep forgetting that. You're not, a, you're not at a table. Sorry. So Brian, if we had inserted a 20 diopter rather than the 24.5, what would have happened to the refractive error? So, okay. Patient would be left excellent, right? So that would have resulted in a hyperopic surprise. That that's my prediction. And as it turned out, we inserted a T9 lens to treat that about five diopters of cylinder that we observed in the pentacam. And with the 24.5, we achieved very close to our target. As opposed to the IOL Asterisk calculator, which recommended a 23 and a half, we would have been left with probably a plus one of spherical equivalent. Or the IOL master by itself, which would have resulted in a plus five, most likely. Okay. So that makes sense. Everyone making sense? Okay. Uh, let's see. He had a pretty bad cataract, um, about two and a quarter. So th he wasn't a very good refractor or occultation. So. Okay. Number three, 67-year-old, lot of cylinder on the manifest, pretty dense cataract. Um, Dan, what do you see on this topo? Big red blob. Excellent. Good. Look at these numbers for a second, 56 and 48. Do those mean anything to you, those high keratometry? Does that point you to any particular diagnosis? Um, right. And so if you look at the central K, inferiorly is actually 62.9 versus the superior zone 59. So that's 3.9 more inferiorly than superiorly. So that does that prove keratoconus? Yes. But it's highly suggestive. Highly suggestive of keratoconus, and he did have keratoconus. And you can look at the uh, at the rings on the keratoscope, and you can see very steep axis pointing this way. If you probe it with the pentacam, you get a much nicer look at what's going on in the central cornea, inferior <coughs> zone of steepening. And again, if you do that same exercise of average. Of averaging the central zone, 0, 1, 2, you get a much different number than what's on the IOL master. And so this was a complex case, keratocone with a with uh, cataract. And so I looked at the keratometries every which way until Sunday. Central topography, Pentacam 0, 1, 2, EKR report, and when you have all of these numbers not really hanging very closely together, I just tend to throw out things I don't like if I don't like the scan, or I average things. And in this particular case, I averaged it and got a mean of 54.08. The cylinder, the topo and the pentacam di disagreed substantially. So here, you have no choice but to sit down with the patient and have a really earnest conversation that part of this is shooting darts in a dark room. And you have to set that expectation that we're going to give it our best effort, but ultimately we can't predict refractive perfection. And the patient was very good about it. Um, we had a T9 lens. I did do some LRIs 
on this keratokinic patient and put the T9 along that axis to the LRIs here and here. Not too aggressive with the LRIs, even though he's 67 and is probably cross-linked from life, didn't want to be too aggressive um, with the LRIs and the keratocone. And the outcome um, was pretty good. He didn't, he was happy. He actually wanted some year. All right, just two more cases, got about 15 minutes. 72-year-old status was LASIK about 15, 16 years ago. Mild cataract. We, we already know he's a high expectation person because he's had his LASIK uh, in the early days. Topo shows this nice central blue zone, very classic of LASIK. Panicam numbers. 31.2 centrally are quite different than what the topo permits. Okay. And so running through that same exercise, averaging the 0, 1, and 2 millimeter zones for predicting the central keratometry, and then averaging the cylinder at 2 and 3 millimeters, which results in about 1.5 diopters of cylinder plugging that into the ILO master, which is from the Panicam 012, that's the axial length, Richter 22, Technus line. This actually correlates very nicely with what the Asterisk calculator predicted, 0 0.75. We hit the head, uh, we hit the nail on the head. Now for the astigmatism, I treated AK at a 7 millimeter optical zone. Reason being he has a LASIK flap. So LRIs don't work as well in a patient with LASIK because it's beyond, the op doing a limbal relaxing incision is beyond the optical zone created by the flap. So I do AKs in, the, in that context at a 7 millimeter zone within the flap. We certainly do need to know the corneal thickness there to uh, know what depth to go to. Last case, 62-year-old, had transplants for keratoconus 30 years ago. Had a cataract done seven years ago in the right eye, left eye four years ago. Their spherical equivalent was very good, right? Uh, let's see. Um, oh, sorry. Picking on you again. Um, What's the spherical equivalent in the left eye? Uh, try again. Good. So minus 3.5 plus half of 6, minus 3.5 plus 3, minus a half, spherical equivalent there. Trent, what's the spherical equivalent on the right eye? So they did a good job with their cataract lens insertion because he was left with spherical equivalent of plus 0.37 in the right eye and minus a half on the left eye. This is what the topo shows. Now, <coughs> 6.12 diopters of cylinder on the right eye, correlating pretty nicely with that refraction. If he had stitches, we would take the stitches out, but all his stitches are out. Okay. This thickness map will be important. Um, just remember, he's got thicknesses of about 600, 700 in the mid peripheral cornea in the right eye. Now, the left eye, he's got 9.16 diopters of cylinder. Why does he only have six diopters of astigmatism under refraction? Any guesses, Trent? It's 
got nine doctors of psoma on the topo, and the topo is a good topo. Okay. Lens is not tilted. Posterior cornea is a good guess. We check the penicam. The penicam says the same. Um, with trial lenses. This was done with trial lenses. <laughs> good, good, good thought. Any guesses? Dan? Lee up here? <coughs> Jim? Any guesses? <laughs> Not the posterior cornea. Okay. So what happened about five, six years ago in the world of PCILL? <coughs> Indeed. So the lens that he had in the left eye um, sorry, the lens that he had in his left eye was a P5 lens. So he didn't have his lens card. We only saw that on dilation. So very important, always <laughs> dilate your patient. So he had a T5 lens and a T5, Jim, how much is a T5 correct? Um, try again. T9 corrects 4.1, so a T5 uh, corrects about two and a quarter, two and a half. Okay, so he had nine diopters of cylinder corrected, two and a half diopters by the T5 <coughs> lens that was inserted at the time. He was left with about six diopters of cylinder um, on his refraction. Okay, so now he comes. He's had his transplant. He's had his cataract. Doc, can you do something for me? I can't wear my contacts anymore. I don't want to wear glasses. <laughs> Any recommendations? So, so LRIs would be outside the graft. AK, fair enough. Um, so we did a new version of AK. We were doing interlaced laser. So we have femtosecond laser already. We have femtosecond laser that works very nicely and that we paid a lot of money for. Um, we do an interlace AK based on this corneal thickness map. We did about 380 microns deep at 7 millimeters on the left eye. On the right eye, based on this corneal thickness map, we did about 580 microns deep with the interlace laser. And th that's the real value of the interlace. With the step knives, with the diamond guarded blades, you have fixed depths. With the interlace, you can really set your depth you know, to whatever micron level you want. And so we did about two, three clock hour incisions on both eyes to treat the six diopters of cylinder at seven millimeters. At 2025-01, we just did this last week. This is what they look like. Very clean, beautiful cuts, precisely done by the interlace. Um, I feel like I'm a good cornea surgeon, but I'm not as good as this manual diamond blade just doesn't cut as good as this. Um, and you can see how that overlays very nicely with the astigmatic zones on the topo. So from the series of cases, um, what I hope uh, you'll take away is that first, don't be afraid of these complex cases. These situations can be tackled in a logical manner. Um, the Aspis calculator is helpful, but not the final word. The central keratometry on the topo and the penicam are both very valuable resources on um, generating uh, both astigmatic planning and keratometric calculation. In the context of RK, very important, figure out how big the optical zone is. Use midday readings. Okay, if you have, all right, what is, why do I mean by that? Okay, um, Jim. What happens to RK patients over the course of decades? Do they become more myopic or hyperopic with time? Excellent. RK is a progressive surgery. R they become more hyperopic over the course of years and decades. Trent, what happens to an RK patient over the course of an individual day? Do they become more myopic at the end of the day or hyperopic at the end of the day? opposite of their decadal product progression. And so an RK patient, if you measure them at 8 o'clock in the morning, 
they will be having a flatter cardia than if you measure them at 6 o'clock at night. So in RK patients, ask what time do you wake up, what time do you go to sleep, and pick a time that they can come in in the <coughs> middle of that day to get a good reading. Or you can tell them to come in in the morning and at the end of the day and average that, but that's a little bit harder to do. Shoot for additional myopia because of that decadal progression of hyperopia. Um, in the post-LASIK PRK patients, a uh, couple of points. Post-myopic patients have um, a more prolate cornea, so you want to treat their spherical aberration more with the technus lens, which has the most negative spherical aberration because the myopic LASIK patients have more positive spherical aberration. The reverse is true for hyperopic LASIK patients. They, the, H, the hyperopic treatment induces negative spherical aberration, so you use an older model lens, which has positive aberration to counteract it. And in these um, really strange corneas with PMD or keratoconus, um, I just like to get all the measurements and average them and have that conversation with the patient, setting expectations. And then in the arsenal of astigmatic therapy, you know, we have lots of different options that can be combined or used uh, individually depending on the situation. Toric lenses, which are useful even if the astigmatism is skewed. You don't need a perfect bow tie for a toric to be useful. Manual MRI, manual AK, and intralasic. So All right, I think my time is up. What questions do you have? I know I've covered a lot of material today. Thank you. Roger. Most RK patients that have us have been watching a lot of them still here for about seven months after surgery. So mm -hmm. they just have to go back because there's a lot of health after care. So right. Yeah, with, with RK patients, don't do anything for at least four or five months because they're going to change um, and just hold their hand and let them know things are going to keep getting better. Um, so it does take a, take a while for the post-RK cornea to stabilize. So the one you showed is mm -hmm. that like the first day after? No, the one I showed was um, uh, about three months out and he was pretty stable from that point on. Any other uh, questions or thoughts? Brad. Um, there's no real long-term data. I um, I undertreat in in um, PMD and keratoconus. I, I'm pretty aggressive in in LASIK and RK with, with astigmatic correction. Um, I, I pretty much treat close to what I would normally treat in a normal cornea. Um, the older the patient, the more stable their cornea is probably going to be, um, just because their, their cornea is probably cross-linked just from natural life. Um, um, those are my general rules of thumb. Thank you. Uh, pollucid margin.